Good afternoon, and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg. Today is Friday, November 25th. It's the day after Thanksgiving, traditionally the uh, busiest shopping day of the calendar year. So I hope that uh, not all of our listeners are out shopping. I should say our usual listeners, because we hope that someone will be listening today and, uh, and will call in if you have any questions about the Bible, about Christianity, about anything that's uh, tweak in your head related to uh, those topics. If you have a dif- difference of opinion from the host of this program and you've heard him say things you don't agree with and you'd like to express and defend an alternate viewpoint, feel free to do that. You're always welcome to do that here. We're with you for an hour live from 2 to 3 in the afternoon Pacific Standard Time. And if you'd like to be on the program, you can call this number, one 800 438 50 That's 1-800-438-5090. We have a couple of lines open for you right now if you'd like to call. So, again, it's 1-800-438-5090. Our first caller today is Frank, who's calling from Albany, Oregon. Uh, Frank, welcome to the program. Hi, Steve. Hi. um, This time I have a question about what's called close communion, C-L-O-S-E. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, are you sure it's not closed communion, C-L-O-S-E-D? No, I would have thought that too, but this is specifically called closed communion. And it's, I don't know, um, I think it's exercised by some people at the uh, Mennonite Church that are friends of mine. And there was a common friend we have that he was there to get, you know, standing up with them to have communion one time. And they were kind of against his having the communion. <laughs> Didn't seem right to me, but... I just wondering if you ever heard of it. And yeah, well, there, there are some groups that do that. They they only will allow you to take communion with them if you're part of their fellowship. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, I guess they feel, you know, they take Paul's words, anyone who takes it unworthily is guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord, and they and I guess they feel they need to protect people from doing that, but that doesn't seem to me very biblical. Uh, first of all, their denomination is not the only denomination there is of true Christians, and... Uh, if people come from another denomination, they're still Christians and still should be in communion. And, and to exclude Christians from communion is to uh, is to divide the body of Christ unnaturally and I think wrongfully. Yeah, it almost because it seemed like they were concerned about First um, Corinthians 11, where it says because there's divisions. Um, I forget, but it almost seemed like they were uh, violating the very scripture that they were trying to obey. <laughs> it's just really strange. Well, like I said, they, they're they concerned about people taking the body and the blood of the Lord unworthily, and that's in 1 Corinthians 11 that warns against that. But um, it's not really the church's responsibility, I don't think. I think it's the individual's responsibility to to determine whether they are, uh, you know, qualified to take communion uh, with the saints. And uh, and if they are, or let's put it this way, if they're not, and they do it anyway, then whatever penalties will come upon them, not on the church, I've, uh, there aren't many groups I know of that practice this kind of closed communion, but um, but there are some, and, and I guess uh, some Mennonite groups would, would be perhaps the type that I might I might not be too surprised to find it in. But I've some Baptist groups and others have done this. Uh, I, I I don't think it's correct. Yeah, but there, there's actually one point where I think it's the church's um, duty to, and that was where he said. If any brother is a fornicator or an idolater, etc. You don't eat with such one, yeah. Right. Yeah. That that part seemed like it was the church to me, but the rest of it, like the unworthy manner, it was the individual examines himself. Right. Well, see, in the case of a brother who's a fornicator or an idolater or a blasphemer or a drunkard, uh, you're not even supposed to eat with him. Well, obviously that presupposes you know that person enough to know that that's what they do. Right. You know that they're that kind of a person. Uh, this closed communion thing is usually restrictive to to people who are from outside the church, that is, people who are unknown to the church and not members. So, I mean, obviously a visitor to the church, it's unlikely that the, that the person would be known to be a fornicator or an idolater or a drunkard, and so I don't think it would be appropriate to exclude them from communion. If they are any of those things, then they, of course, they take the risk upon their own head. Right. Okay. Thanks. Okay, Frank, good talking to you. Yeah, bye. Have a good good weekend. Bye-bye. You're listening to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg. If you'd like to be on the program, we have a couple of lines right now. Open to you at 1-800-438-5090.
1-800-438-5090. That's 1-800-438-5090. Eric from Sacramento, California. Welcome to the program. Hi, Steve. Hi. Hi. Uh, just a question as far as um, the wars and the battles that take place in, like, the Old Testament and basically how, um, you know, I had someone approach me in regards to that and with all the stuff going on in the Middle East with, you know, the uh, people, the suicide bombers and stuff like that and how they say, you know, all... Uh, you know, told them to to do this and justifies that reasoning, and then they say, well, didn't in the Old Testament, you know, God tell Christians to go into cities and wipe out, you know, entire entire cities, including the children and, and women. So I was just curious as far as you know how how to reply to them on uh, in regard. Yeah, well, that that is difficult. That is difficult to our sensitivities. It's not necessarily difficult in terms of the sense of justice, but there, here's where some of the problems arise. To a person who's not sympathetic toward the God of the Bible, uh, it looks just the same as the jihad of the of the Muslims. Uh, you know, if, if Allah is claimed to have told the Muslims to go out and kill all the infidels, and uh, Yahweh in the Old Testament told the children of Israel to go wipe out all the Canaanites, to a, to a person who is neither a Muslim nor a Christian nor a Jew, but just an outside looking in, it looks all the same. You know, here's here's some fierce people saying that their God tell them, told them to kill everybody. Now, of course, where the difference lies is, is if there really is a God who told anyone to do any of that stuff. And uh, I believe that the evidence for Yahweh's reality and for Moses and Joshua being his chosen uh, spokesmen and leaders, who are the ones who led them into these battles, um, I think the evidence is very strong that, that, is, that, that that's the real God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who has the right to do whatever he wants to do, including uh, determine how and when people will die. And I don't, I don't mean to say that callously. To me, human death is a great tragedy. To Jesus it was, too. He even wept at the tomb of a man that he intended to raise from the dead because I think he saw death as a great tragedy and a great uh, cause of mourning for people. But at the same time, death is a reality that faces every human being at some point, everyone will die, and it is God's prerogative to decide whether a person dies young, old, or middle-aged, and uh, and in what manner. <clears throat> so if if God allows people to die in an earthquake or a tsunami, it's a terrible thing to the to those who are survivors. But it's no different to the ones who died than if they died of cancer or or were you know murdered or 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 died in war or something else like that. Death is death. In fact, some some deaths are far worse than dying in war. At least, uh, you know, if, if the Israelites killed people by the sword at the command of God, that is not as gruesome a form of, of death as uh, maybe some some lingering sicknesses are by which people die. Now, I realize that even talking like this, even talking with any sense of sympathy toward these kinds of wars in the Old Testament, sounds very offensive to people who are not Christians. And I can't help that. I didn't write the Bible. I'm only the follower of the Bible, and the Bible is uh, inspired by God and written by his prophets, so I'm not ashamed of what it says. I, I find some of the things difficult, but then it shouldn't be surprising that a, a, a foolish and fallen man like I might find some things about God difficult to understand, because God's perfect and I'm not. But uh, when it comes to the Muslims claiming the same thing, the difficulty here is finding any reason to believe in their God. Uh, or finding any reason to believe in their prophet. You see, the prophets of the Old Testament were proven to be prophets of God, and one way they proved it was that God spoke to them and predicted future events so that they could prove that these were his true prophets. And if they predicted something that didn't come true, they weren't. But they did predict things that did come true all the time. And this is what caused their, uh, <coughs> their you know, the later generations of Jews to recognize that these men were the true prophets of God. Some of these prophets of God were killed uh, or persecuted by their, their contemporary Jewish neighbors, but because they successfully predicted specific events long before they occurred, and then they did occur, uh, you know, they were later recognized as prophets of Yahweh. And uh, yet Muhammad, I don't think, has done anything that would convince me that he is a prophet. Uh, you know, he, he led the, the, the Arab people to mighty victories in war, and he gave them... Uh, uh, you know, a religious system that certainly uh, appealed to them and which has taken over the Middle East to a very large degree and much of the rest of the world, but that doesn't make him a prophet. You know, Joseph Smith uh, started a religion also, and he made claims similar to that of Muhammad. Muhammad claimed that the angel Gabriel 
appeared to him and gave him the Quran. Well, Joseph Smith claimed that the angel Moroni appeared to him and gave him the Book of Mormon. It's really the same kind of a claim. But the problem with these claims is that no one can valid, no one can test them. No one can find out, you know, whether uh, either Joseph Smith or Muhammad ever saw an angel. Uh, if somebody likes what these men teach and likes the group that was founded by them, then they might be drawn to their ideas and to that religion. But there's really no objective basis for believing it. Whereas there is plenty of objective basis for believing both uh, Judaism and Christianity, uh, that is Old Testament Judaism and New Testament Christianity, because the, the writers gave their credentials in prophetic writing and in the miracles that were done through many of them. Uh, so when we look at the, the twin claims, let us say, that the Muslims claim that their God, through their prophet, Muhammad, has told them to kill the infidels, and, uh, and the Jews in the Old Testament say that their God, Yahweh, told them to kill the Canaanites. Well, I guess the question is, does, you know, are both of these people hallucinating? Or is one of them really in touch with the real God and really we're taking orders from the real God? When, when the question is posed and the, and the two options are examined, it seems to me like there's excellent reason to believe that Moses and, and Joshua were acting under the orders of the God who created the universe and to whom we all must answer, whereas there's not excellent evidence, to my mind, that Mohammed was hearing from any God at all. Yeah, that's, just, yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. And one way, too, I, I kind of tried to explain to him was, you know, looking at, like, the flood or, or Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, how, how God judged them, you know, supernaturally in those including ways. The, including women and children, right. Yeah, I mean, exactly. that's just it. I mean, for God to tell them to, to slay the women and children sounds horrible to us, and if God hadn't told them to, it would be an atrocity. But, but it, when God actually tells his people, listen, th this nation, the Canaanites, these people have been slaughtering their own children and sacrificing them to, to demons on a regular basis for several hundred years. And they do things that are an abomination to me. And I just don't want anything left of them. Now, God could have sent fire and brimstone on them like he did Sodom and Gomorrah. That, would, uh, that, that achieved the same result in terms of human casualties. But it would destroy the land. And this is the land that God intended to give to his people. To Abraham's offspring. So he said, "Okay, we're not going to incinerate the land. You just go in and and conquer it." And uh, and uh, of course, it was to be a hundred percent enemy casualties. Take no prisoners, you know. But now, now not all of the Jews' wars were to be done like that. And in Deuteronomy, God says, "Okay, now when it doesn't, when it's not the Canaanites you're going to war uh, against, you don't do that." And He gave them different rules for war, where you don't just go and kill all the women and children, you know. But the Canaanite societies, it was their time to go. That's what God said. It was their time to be judged, and, and Israel was to be the agency of judgment. And, again, I realize that to a radio show like this, you know, we're, we're going out over the airwaves, and there's non-Christians, and there's people who are not 100% sympathetic toward uh, the Old Testament listening and so forth, and they're going to say, well, this is, you know, how can you, how can you speak of such things uh, sympathetically at all? Well, I, I don't have any choice. If it's the Word of God, I'm obliged to believe it. And it is. Uh, so if I was in a different profession, if I wasn't a, a Bible teacher uh, or, or a Bible believer, I would be at liberty to criticize this. But I'm not. I'm, I am a, a teacher of the Bible, and I believe what the Bible says. So I believe that the wars of conquest of Canaan, uh, where the Jews were told to exterminate the Canaanites, they didn't actually, but they should have, uh, that those were done at the behest of the real God. And I don't believe that the God of the Muslims is the real God. And this isn't just a, uh, you know, this isn't just a, a preference I have for one religion over the other. Although I guess I would, I certainly would prefer Christianity over Islam if all other things were equal. But all other things are not equal. Islam does not have the kind of uh, truth claims or the kind of support for its truth claims that the revealed religions of, of uh, Judaism and Christianity have. And that's why I choose the one I do, to believe. Uh, and everyone else has to make their own choice. So I think a lot of people make choices out of prejudice and without considering evidence. I haven't done that. I've looked at the evidence and I've made my decision just like I'd make any other decision based on evidence. Yeah, something too I find interesting was, that, you know, the first battle that, that they were told to do was against Jericho. And although they were the, you know, the tools used to, to, you know, bring down the walls, they didn't necessarily, you know, kill the people. But yet the next, I believe it was the next battle against AI, you know, they, they went, at, went at it, you know, without God's blessings. And, and so, I mean, it just seemed kind of interesting that, 
that God used them to destroy Jericho, that he's the one who actually did the destroying. But once they kind of messed up, it seemed, I mean, I don't know if that correlates to anything or not, but... Well, they actually they actually did kill the people in Jericho. Uh, God God knocked the wall down, and uh, Israelites did go and, and slaughter people in there, but they spared Rahab and her family. But there were times there were times when God told them not to fight. He when He told them to surrender, as in the case of Jeremiah telling the Jews to surrender to Babylon. There were times when He told them not to fight, and that He would fight on their behalf, as in the war of, uh, that Jehoshaphat, king of Jerusalem, was. Uh, uh, facing in Second Chronicles chapter 20. You know, God just said, listen, you don't fight in this battle. Just send your musicians out and, and worship me, and I'll take care of it. There, there was a time when Hezekiah was besieged by the Assyrians, and God didn't uh, require the Jews to, to fight them. He sent an angel out who slew 185,000 of the Assyrians while they slept, and, uh, and that was the end of that siege. So, I mean, it, it's not always the same in the Old Testament. Sometimes God did use the swords of the Israelites as the instruments of his judgment. But as frequently, he used other means, or sometimes sometimes even had them surrender. Well, it seems like even as far as God's mercy goes, I, I don't remember the passage offhand, but in, in the Old Testament it talked about, there's like a real brief verse that hinted at God basically gave the Canaanites like some hundreds of years to to change their ways, you know, or, or something like that. I don't, I don't know if you know that passage or... Yes, yeah, it's, it's Genesis 15. In Genesis 15, God told Abram that, his descendants would spend 400 years enslaved in Egypt, and then they would come back to the land Abraham was in, and they would wipe out the Canaanites and take the land. And he said, but your people will, will be 400 years in Egypt first. He's, he's actually in a land that is not theirs. And he says, uh, because the iniquity of the Amorites, meaning the Canaanites, is not yet full. And what that means is that in Abraham's day, although the... Canaanites were doing atrocious things in the sight of any civilized nation. I mean, if we, if any civilized people, Christian or not, would recognize what they did in, in you know, burning their children on altars and idols, you know, to goat-headed gods and so forth, and then having orgies in front of the altar while the baby burned alive. Uh, I mean, this is the, this is the normal custom of the Canaanites for hundreds of years, and God tolerated this. So, you know, what's, what's open to question? To sensitive hearts is not why did God eventually wipe these people out. The question is why did He wait hundreds of years to do it? But the Bible seems to indicate that God gave them 400 years while the Jews were in the cooler in Egypt uh, before before Joshua and the troops came and wiped them out. He gave them 400 years to repent, which they didn't do. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's basically all I had. Thanks, Steve. All right. Good talking to you, Eric. All right, God bless you. God bless you. Bye bye. All right, we're, uh, we got one line open now because Eric's no longer on it. If you'd like to be on the program, you can call 1-800-438-5090. That's 1-800-438-5090. And uh, you're listening to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg. Our next caller is uh, Fred from Greenfield, California. Fred, welcome to the program. Uh, hello, Steve. Uh, I've got a, I lost a crown yesterday, so I may sound a little strange, but... I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, in my life, uh, there's been many times when even though I haven't actually killed somebody or something like that, uh, I know that I fall short of the uh, perfect standard that like we have in the Sermon on the Mount. And yet, uh, so it's kind of a dilemma, it seems to me, that uh, we read things in the Bible uh, instructive to our behavior, which I don't disagree with. But on the other hand, we have this sin nature, which I understand we won't, we will continue to have uh, in this life. So in more of a nutshell, in John uh, 1.8, it says, uh, if you uh, believe something to the effect, if you believe you're without sin, you deceive yourself. But it, John, right. mm -hmm. And in Matthew, the end of uh, it, uh, chapter 5, verse 48, we're told to be perfect, which seems to be something that we can't possibly do. So uh, I'd like to see how you would reconcile that, or how should we view that, and I'll listen uh, on the air. Okay, Fred. Thanks for your call. Okay. All right. So there seems to be tension, uh, Fred feels, between the command of Christ in Matthew 5 to be perfect, as your Father in Heaven is perfect, on the one hand, and the statement in 1 John 1.8 that if anyone says they're without sin, uh, they're a liar. Now, 
I believe that uh, the, the difficulty comes in understanding the meaning of Jesus' statement in Matthew, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. However, even if we would decide that that passage could be in any sense um, you know, reduced in terms of the severity of what it demands, in terms of perfection, uh, that would not uh, that would not take away from us the the fact that the Bible puts us under obligation to seek perfection, to seek to be holy, to seek to live without sin. It says in First John chapter two, the, the same book that says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. It says just a few verses later in chapter two, it says these things I write unto you so that you do not sin. So the Christian's goal is to not sin, is to live in sinless perfection, but it is also the case that our goal is not likely to be reached in this lifetime because we are in a warfare and we are human and our, there's a part of our nature that still fights against our resolve to live a holy life. Paul talked about this in Romans 7. He mentions it in Galatians 5 also. He said the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these two are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things that you want to do. Now, if you want to do what's good, you can't do that all the time because of this warfare. Now, he says actually so that you do not do. He didn't say you can't. He says so that you do not do what you want to do. Uh, technically, God has given us all things necessary for life and godliness, and he gives us the resources to live a holy life if we choose to do so. But we have to choose it on a moment-by-moment -moment basis because that's how temptations come to us, moment-by-moment. -moment. And, uh, you know, I may wake up this morning saying, okay, I'm going to live a holy life. I'm not going to sin at all. Uh, but I, can't, I don't know when I wake up exactly what temptations I'm going to face, where they're going to come from, but I have to be on my guard because my resolve to live holy does not guarantee that I will live holy. I may, in fact, uh, you know, be waylaid by a, a temptation that I don't anticipate. So I'm thinking that living a perfect life is something that very few people could claim they've done. I don't think I know anyone who's lived what I would call a perfect life. But what does Jesus mean when he says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, in the passage in Matthew 5, that's the closing remark of his statement about loving your enemies and doing good to those who persecute you and, and not only uh, greeting your friends and those who are good to you, but, you know, he says if you greet those uh, who greet you and if you love those who love you, so what? Everyone can do that. That's not exceptional, that you need to love your enemies and do good to those who aren't good to you. That's, that's basically his teaching. And at the end of that in Matthew, he says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, the word perfect in the Greek can mean uh, mature or complete as well as flawless. When we think of perfect, we think of flawless. Uh, but it, in the Greek, the word can also mean complete or total. And I believe that in this particular context, we have to understand him to mean uh, be total or complete in your love in terms of not being, dis uh, you know, not being discriminating between friends and enemies in this respect. You love your enemies just like your father does, loves his enemies. Uh, the reason I say that is because the parallel to it in Luke 6 seems to point strongly that direction. Uh, in Luke 6, it says in verse 35, But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Therefore, verse 36, Luke 6, 36 says, Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Now, if you put the two sermons side by side, this statement in Luke, be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful, is parallel to Matthew's record saying, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. In other words, being perfect in this context means being perfectly merciful. And being perfectly merciful means that you're merciful not only to people who are your friends, but also to your enemies. That you're comprehensively loving. That your love is not you know, restricted to the people who are kind to you. That you love your enemies and those who hurt you and persecute you too. That's, that's the mercy. That's the total love of God that, God that Christ is telling us to have. Now, that still may sound like an impossibility, though it's somewhat different than the requirement to be absolutely perfect in the sense of flawless in every way. His, his, the command, be perfect, means being perfectly merciful, being perfectly loving, as your Father in heaven is. And again, as I said, that only means that you don't restrict your love and your mercy to you know, your, your best friends or, or, or people who are not your enemies. Now, 
loving your enemy in itself is a pretty hard deal. But we're not supposed to do that on our own strength. We're not supposed to do really anything that God requires in our own strength. We're supposed to be walking in the Spirit. And it says in Galatians, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Spirit of God gives you power over your fleshly tendencies, including your fleshly tendency to be angry and, and hateful toward people who hurt you. And so walking, the Spirit's fruit is love. And when Jesus commands us to love, he doesn't expect us just to have more willpower in that direction. He expects us to be enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. And that can't happen unless we're filled with the Holy Spirit, which, of course, is something that all of us can be, who are, all who are saved. It's the birthright of every Christian to be filled with the Spirit, if you will. Uh, the Bible commands us to be filled with the Spirit. So this is really what it comes down to. We're, we're supposed to love everybody as, as God loves everybody. And this requires that we walk in the Spirit. But that's something every Christian can do, if they will. Every Christian should. It's our requirement. But we don't do it perfectly because there is this warfare between the flesh and the Spirit. And we sometimes are foolish enough or weak enough that we, we, uh, we go with the flesh instead of with the Spirit. And that, of course, leads to us having imperfection in our, in our lives. And that's why John says if we say we don't have any sin, we're deceiving ourselves. But he says, I'm writing to you so that you won't sin. And that is to be the goal. We should always, I think, live our Christian life with the realization that sin is likely, occasionally, to be something that we will succumb to, but we are not satisfied that that is so. We are determined to stop sinning. We are determined to avoid sin. We're not, we're not pleased to simply sin and say, well, oh, well, the mercy of God will cover this one. Um, we are sorry about sin because God is sorry about sin. God doesn't like sin. But he is merciful towards sin. And so both things are true. Uh, we are supposed to aim at perfection. We are supposed to aim at sinlessness. But we're supposed to do so with the realism that if we fall short from time to time, it's not as though we're not really Christians. Real Christians do fall short. All people fall short. So that's, that's how I treat the tension between those two concepts that you brought up. I hope that may be helpful. I don't know. I don't know if it is or not because you're not still on the line. But I appreciate your call. Uh, we've got some lines open for you. We're going to talk next to Carol Lee from Seaside, uh, California. And if you'd like to be on the program, we can take your call anytime in the next uh, 20 minutes. But after that, it'll be too late. The number is 1-800-438-5090. one 438 5090 If you have a question from the Bible or about Christianity, or if you uh, just want to call to disagree with the host and tell us why, do so. 1-800-438-5090. Carol Lee from Seaside, welcome to the program. Thank you, Steve. Hi. Um, I'm a little confused on um, the teaching behind what happens when we die. I hear people like the Seventh-day Adventist teaching that we just go to sleep. We're like in a sleep state for a period of time. And then I hear other people teaching, like recently there was someone that had a program on this station that um, he recently passed away, and they're saying, well, we know now that he's in heaven with Jesus. And um, so there seems to be both teachings going around, and I'm confused on that. I'd like to know what you believe is what the Bible says about it. Well, the, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists believe in a doctrine called soul sleep which means right. that when a person dies, they lose consciousness, and they don't regain consciousness until the resurrection when Jesus returns. Mm -hmm. And then, then when their bodies are raised from the dead at the second coming of Christ, at that time, uh, their bodies uh, come alive again, and, and they, they are, you know, they're conscious again for the first time since their death. And in right. the meantime, they've been in a state like sleep. Now, the verses that the Seventh-day Adventists use for that um, well, there's quite a few verses, actually, but one of them is in uh, Ecclesiastes 9, where it says that the dead know nothing at all. Uh, now, if that's, if that's true, then they sound like they're correct. Uh, if the dead don't know anything, then they must be unconscious. However, in Ecclesiastes 9, as with the rest of the book of Ecclesiastes, we have to note that Solomon is writing to us about the way he used to think and the way he used to live. And he's telling us what's so empty in living apart from God, as he did for a while. And the, the book of uh, Ecclesiastes is his testimony 
of his backsliding and and the frustration and his uh, empty uh, you know experience in searching for a reality outside of God. And he begins chapter 9 with the words, I considered in my heart. Now, he didn't say that he still thinks this way, but he's telling us about his past when he was away from God. He says, I considered in my heart. And then it went on and talked some other things. And, it, and finally he says and that the dead know nothing at all. Uh, it seems that the, the idea that the dead don't know anything is simply uh, a reflection of what he thought at one time. But he's not saying now that he believes that or that it's true. And so I don't think that verse necessarily proves that point. And there's a verse in the Psalms that says of the wicked that in the day they perish, their thoughts cease. But many people think that, uh, many scholars believe the word thoughts there is referring to their plans. Their plans come to an end when they die. And so it wouldn't be saying that they go into unconsciousness. But the main argument for soul sleep, I believe, is the fact that the word sleep is so often used by Jesus and Paul uh, as a metaphor for death. Uh, Jesus said of Lazarus, uh, Lazarus is asleep. And his disciples said, well, if he's asleep, he'll get better. And Jesus said, no, I mean, he's dead. But when he came into Jairus' house, when the daughter had died, Jesus said, she's not dead, she's asleep. And uh, so Paul also talked about, you know, we shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed. And, and those who sleep in Jesus will he bring with him when he comes. There's all these references to death as sleep in Scripture. And that, that has led many people to believe that there is a, a sleep-like state that people go into. Well, death is a little bit like sleep. And the metaphor is an apt one, obviously, or else Jesus and Paul wouldn't use it. But the question is, what is the comparison? What is the comparison between sleep and death? Now, one comparison that is obvious is that when a person is asleep, they are immobile, they're lying there with their eyes closed, and they're not really, you know, involved. In, the, in their environment, the, peop- the people around there, they're kind of in another world, as it were. Um, and, and death is as apparently that way, too, at least all appearances. A uh, person who's dead does not seem to be there. They seem to be uninvolved. They, they look very much like a sleeping person. And death is like sleep in that way. Death is also like sleep in that it's temporary. And that's the point, I think, that's being made biblically when death is like in sleep, because it's in, in passages that are talking about the resurrection, primarily, that we find the word sleep used of death. Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, are all passages talking about the resurrection of the dead. And in saying those who have died in Christ, they're asleep, is talking about how they are in a temporary state, not a permanent state. Sleep is temporary, and people wake up from it, and that is the point that's being made. They're going to wake up from their sleep. But the real question for the Seventh Adventists uh, is, is there a likeness between death and sleep in terms of unconsciousness? Because they say that sleep means your soul is asleep. Well, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say that the soul sleeps. If a person is asleep, literally, they're not really unconscious. They have dreams. Their mind is active. Uh, they can sometimes even interact uh, in their sleep with people. I know I have. I've answered Bible questions in my sleep, people have told me. Uh, and I know that, I know that you know, people can hear an alarm clock when they're asleep and stuff. So they're not really unconscious. Their mind is just elsewhere. And so if God wanted to tell us that death was an unconscious state, sleep is not really a metaphor that works because sleep is not an unconscious state. Sleep is just where your, your, your consciousness is, is in another world, as it were. And that's true of death. When a person dies, at least when a Christian dies, their spirit, I believe their conscious part of them, goes to be with the Lord. So that we read Paul saying that you know, he's eager to be absent from his body so that he can be present with the Lord in Philippians chapter 1 and also 2 Corinthians 5. So I believe that... Uh, the doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventists, I think, is mistaken. But they have the wording of some passages, uh, you know, in their favor, it would appear. But I think they misunderstand what that wording is, is, is saying. Mm-hmm. So it's your understanding, then, that, that when we die, we go straight to be with the Lord? Yes, I believe that when we die, our spirit, our conscious part of us, goes to be with the Lord and will be consciously worshiping Him in His presence. We see examples of that in the book of Revelation. Uh, people in heaven worshiping, and this is before the resurrection, this is before the second coming of Christ that we see this. So, I think that's where we go. 
But when Jesus comes back, he brings us with him. It says that in First Thessalonians 4.14. Right. That he'll bring those who sleep with him, with him when he comes. And um, then he'll raise our bodies from the dead and put us back in them. Ah, that's when we get our glorified bodies. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, don't, don't the Seventh-day Adventists also have a different teaching about what the soul is? I think I so. Think they think that the soul is something different, that we're body, soul, and spirit. They, I think they believe that we're just spirit and soul. Uh, and I, th- th- that's very possible. That's very possible. I, I don't know about them, but I know there are many Christians, and they could be among them, who are what we call dichotomous instead of trichotomous. Uh, a trichotomist believes there's three parts of man, body, soul, and spirit. A dichotomist believes there's only two parts, the body and then the spiritual part of man, which is the soul and spirit. The, the Seventh-day Adventists may very well believe that, but so are, there are many Christians I know who are not uh, Seventh-day Adventists who believe such a thing, too. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, thanks, Steve. I really appreciate you clearing that up for me. I appreciate you calling, Carolee. Sure. sure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. All right, you're listening to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and you're welcome to call if you'd like. We have Brad from Arvada, Colorado, we're going to talk to next. And we have lines open for you at 1-800-438-5090. Hi, Brad, welcome to the program. Hi, I wonder if you might uh, be able to comment on uh, just a small question that I come across. In Acts 21.3, it mentions them sailing to... uh, Tyre, landing at Tyre. Uh huh. And I had always thought that Tyre had been uh, completely wiped out according to the prophecy in Ezekiel, and that, uh, you know, it'd be never again a place inhabited on the earth and just a place where fishermen would lay their nets and, and so on and so forth. But yet I see this reference to it here in Acts. Yeah, well, Tyre is actually still there now. In fact, it, it's not. Uh, Ezekiel doesn't say that Tyre would not be inhabited at all, it says it'll never be rebuilt. Uh, you know, Tyre was a tremendous walled fortress in the time of Ezekiel, and it was destroyed by Alexander the Great. And, uh, well, it was actually the fortress on land was destroyed earlier by Nebuchadnezzar, but then Tyre also had this other fortress out on an island, out on a rock out at sea, and, and uh, it was later destroyed by Alexander the Great, and, and thus fulfilling the prophecy of Ezekiel. But the prophecy was not that there would no, not be people there. Now, um, Actually, uh, there are some prophecies about other places that do seem to speak of them being uninhabited forever, but that's not mentioned in Ezekiel 27, 28, 29. I think those are the chapters about it. Um, And, um, yeah, it's not been rebuilt as before. Now, there there has been civilization there. I mean, there is, there, it's, I think what most people understand the spreading of nets to refer to is that it'd be more of a fishing village rather than the thriving uh, uh, okay. industrial metropolis. Well, it wasn't industrial, but it was, it was tr- uh, a commercial metropolis in the time of Ezekiel. And it's, it never became that again. It was never restored. Okay, good enough. Now, one other thing I wanted to ask was uh, kind of a strange question, maybe, but you had uh, <clears throat> you brought up uh, a guy named Lonnie um, Frisbee, Frisbee? In, your, in your lectures. Yeah. And uh, it kind of got me to thinking, you know, is this guy a great man of God or is he a wretched man that others... Yeah, I mean, I, it's kind of a mysterious character, obviously. Lonnie was an enigma. Mm-hmm. And he had uh, he had died of AIDS, but in your uh, lecture, you seemed to imply that, that, was, that he had been raped, possibly, or, and that that was the cause of it. I'm not sure. And I couldn't find any reference to that in my brief, you know, investigation yeah. of his life on... Online. When I first heard when I first heard about Lonnie's death uh, of AIDS, I was told that uh, that he that he claimed he had been raped. But I think it's come out since that he I mean he may have been raped um, uh, maybe more than once. But he also had lived at, at certain times in his life uh, sex, a homosexual lifestyle. Not at all times. He was. Uh, I don't have any evidence that he was living as a homosexual in the time that he was. Uh, you know, serving God in the Jesus movement. Maybe, maybe he was, and we didn't know it, but we didn't know it at the time. But, uh, you know, God has am- been amazingly merciful to people who are flawed, you know. I mean, Samson is a great example of a man who who really was morally a flawed individual. But God, the Spirit came upon him, and he did mighty feats. And, and I believe 
that Lonnie did mighty feats through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are some who, be, because of Lonnie's homosexuality, have said, well, that can't be God. It must have been demons. You know, the, the power that was on must be demonic. Well, uh, it is always possible, of course, that demons can mimic the power of God, but the, the problem I have with that is the fruit of Lonnie's ministry was far more the kind that I expect to find from the work of the Holy Spirit than from demons. I mean, there were literally thousands of people who got saved through Lonnie's preaching. Uh, there were many, many people who uh, were filled with the Spirit through his uh, ministry. I was one of them. Uh, he was a, you know... He was this, uh, kind of an unusual guy. He was a hippie uh, who got, I believe, I believe he got really saved. I believe he's in heaven. But he had his struggles. Now, almost all Christians I know have struggles of some kind. But for some reason, we, we consider homosexuality to be a, a greater sin than maybe whatever it is sins we struggle with. I'm not sure. I mean, it may be. It may be a greater sin than the ones I struggle with. But whether it is or not, uh, mine are no good either. And God uses me, I'm, I hope. And... Uh, so I, you know, I don't certainly don't want to justify Lonnie Frisbee's uh, lapses into into sin, and I did hear early on that he had been raped. That's what the, the report that came to me first when I first heard of his AIDS. Uh, but that, you know, many things have come out since then, and uh, I di- I didn't realize until after his death that he really had had a uh, some some homosexual lifestyle. Before, I guess the struggles before he was a Christian, and apparently it got the better of him at times later in his life too. Okay, and also uh, I've seen references to even going so far as to say they swear he had healed the blind and so forth. And uh... that's there were reports of that. I you know there were tremendous miracles that happened in his meetings at Calvary Chapel. Uh, you know, Calvary Chapel is not an, um, uh, a denomination that really lays a lot of emphasis on miracles and healings and things like that. And uh, Lonnie, doing this kind of thing as much as he did, uh, began to be something of, I think, of an embarrassment to the Calvary Chapel. This was before there were any more than one. There was only one Calvary Chapel at this time. It was in Costa Mesa, California. And Lonnie uh, was, uh, through some kind of unpleasantness, to actually split from Calvary Chapel and, and began to link up with the Vineyard Movement eventually uh, because it was more, you know, it, it had more appreciation for what he had to do. But, you know, I'm not here to say, you know, great things about Lonnie. I just know that God did great things through Lonnie. And he was a friend of mine later. Uh, when, when he laid hands on me, I, he wasn't. I was just a kid and he was, uh, he, you know, he was a minister of a big church. Uh, but... But later in life, uh, we were both living in Santa Cruz, uh, actually, where I live now, and we became friends because we were in a smaller church together. And he had, uh, at that time, his, his marriage had broken up, and and, uh, and so had mine, and so we had something in common there. We were both ministering in a small church in, in, in Santa Cruz, and so we got to know each other pretty well. Now, this uh, that was uh, particularly uh, interesting for me because I'm not one that's, that's have very traditionally believed in the perpetuity of, you know, of the gift. divine gifts and so forth. And I yeah. think you even made reference sometime in the last, maybe this was quite a while ago, a couple hundred years ago in one of your church history lectures maybe, but that someone had actually been raised from the dead and that there was some documented evidence of that. Is that right? or Raised uh, by Lonnie? No, no, no. Just in, oh. uh, just in general that there, there was, a, you know, a, at least one documented case you had heard of someone being raised from the dead. I've heard of I've heard of more than one, but I can't document them. That's the problem. You know, I mean, back in the uh, 60s and early 70s, there was a tremendous revival taking place in Indonesia. It was recorded by a guy named Naltari uh, in a book called Like a Mighty Wind. And I had friends who actually went over to Indonesia to see the revival, and they came back and they reported that, uh, you know, the kinds of things that the book reported were, in fact, happening, and they saw them, including... Uh, now, my fr- I don't think my friends ever saw the dead raised, but but uh, the the raising of the dead uh, at least once or more uh, is said to have taken place. Uh, in the the book actually records it, and and there were other miracles. The blind eyes were opened and things like that. There were a lot of miracles in Indonesia during that time. Um, it was the same period of time essentially that the Jesus movement was happening in this country. Uh, but the kind of miracles that were happening in Indonesia were not reported so much in the Jesus movement. So, I mean, there were certainly the Jesus movement believed in the perpetuity of what you call the sign gifts. 
and we saw things happen, I mean, uh, but not as dramatic as the raising of the dead. I actually did hear of, uh, re- again, reports of the dead being raised through the ministry of Lani over in Africa. He, he went to Africa frequently to minister, and he went to Sweden frequently to minister. Um, and uh, I, I never went with all, He invited me to go with him to Africa back in 1980, uh, and I, I considered it. But uh, I, but he ended up canceling that trip, and we didn't go. But uh, I, I never saw these miracles uh, done by Lonnie. But I knew people who were in meetings where they reportedly happened. Now I don't. Ex- now, by the way, I'm not trying to convince any skeptic in our audience that these things really happened. Right. Uh, I, re- I was I was going, and I'm wondering if I'm barking up the wrong tree, and even trying to, you know, use that as an evangelistic tool. I guess maybe. I- I wouldn't use it as an evangelist tool because of the because I don't know how to I don't know that any of these things could be documented, and so I'm simply saying I don't have any reason to doubt them. They came to me from good sources, but I wouldn't expect a skeptic to accept it on my gullibility. Well, you know, I mean, <clears throat> well then let me uh, reference one other, and that's uh, the reports of the uh, um, uh, possessed person, and obviously I guess this wouldn't be a proper evangelistic tool, but. In one of your lectures, and maybe about uh, 200 years ago, there was a person that was possessed, and they were uh, bleeding buckets worth of blood and uh, wild yeah. dogs and bats coming out of their mouths. Now that that did happen, and that and that was very documented. That's right. That was that was uh, Pastor uh, Christoph Blumhart, who was a, a Lutheran pastor in a small Lutheran church, and he was not a he was not interested in being a miracle worker. He was not he was just a humble, an ordinary kind of Lutheran guy, pastor. And, uh, and and a young girl in his congregation started having very weird manifestations and uh, seemingly supernatural things happening with her. And he he was told about it, and he was asked to go pray for her, so he went to pray for her, and, and he began to see weird things. And they were so weird that he began to uh, – he'd visit her on a regular basis over a period of two years, but he'd always take with him a medical doctor and the mayor of the town because because the things he was seeing were so unbelievable – he he just didn't think anyone would believe him, so he he visited her with these two reputable witnesses uh, frequently, and finally all the demons were cast out of her. But it took a long time, and and there were t- I, the time I think when the, when the bucket full of blood seemed to be coming out of her, out of her eyes and her ears and her nose. And her breath, I think the whole town was around her house looking in the windows because I mean when when Bloomhart got there, see he often would have some messenger come say, "Oh, you've got to come because she's you know having some problems." Yeah, I think when he came running to that one, the whole village was looking in the windows watching this happen. You know, I mean, so he. what I read first, I, I've read other books about him since, and he was very well known. Carl Barth uh, was an admirer of his. Uh, 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 Dietrich Bonhoeffer was an admirer of his later on. But, but uh, anyway, uh, Pastor Bloomhart was a very meek and uh, non-sensational kind of a man, but he had the most sensational experience I've ever read about. And, and I first read it, in his own account that he wrote to the leaders of his denomination because he felt like he should give them a full account of it. It was like a, almost like uh, his journal of his dealings with this case. And, uh, and it, it was published under the title Bloomhart's Battle. It's, I think it's out of print now, but I have a few old copies of it. But, now, would you ever yeah. suggest something like that to a cr- critic I mean, or to a skeptic? Well... You know, not necessarily. I mean, if if a skeptic said he didn't believe there were demons, I guess I would say, well, I know there are. I mean, I I mean, there's as good documentation for that as there is for most anything that can be documented historically. But um, you know, I, I I wouldn't if I'm talking to an unbeliever, I wouldn't bring that up as a you know well, yeah, as one of the, one of the ways to convince them that Christianity is true. But yeah, I'm I'm just saying maybe in case they said, well, demons are even more ridiculous than. Uh gods or something like that. I don't know. Maybe it well, yeah. That, uh, people who say that, of course, are showing how ignorant they are of, of phenomena that they've never seen or never known how to interpret. But And that was the point of this recent movie that came out. Now, I didn't see that movie, but I uh, I, I thought about seeing it. Uh, you know, the, the movie The Exorcist that came out many years ago was based on a true case, and I have read the, uh, I've read the actual case uh, from, from priests Actually, the priests who were dealing with uh, the young man, in, in the movie The Exorcist, it was a girl, but in the real case, it was a, young, a boy, a 14-year-old boy. The priests who were dealing with it kept journals of it, and their journals have, were, uh, were, were published. And I've read, I've read about what they wrote, and 
you know, there, I mean, there's no way, there's no way that uh, an open-minded person could say there were no demons there. You know, that's clearly demonic. I mean, supernatural things happened. I won't go into them now, uh, but they're they're just about as bizarre as the stuff in the movie. I mean, the head didn't turn all the way around and stuff like that. That was made up for the movie, but but a lot of the really weird uh, supernatural things did happen, and. Uh, you know, and other cases from the mission field. I've read many cases from uh, from Indonesia and from Cambodia and from uh, oh, lots of different lands, India and so forth, where demon possessed people did a lot of that kind of stuff. I mean, the person who says he doesn't believe in demons is simply showing he's ignorant. He doesn't know about phenomena that do occur, and where uh, in some parts of the world it's much more common than here. All right. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, Brad, good talk to you. You too, bye. Okay, bye-bye now. All right, let's talk to Newell, who's calling from Carmel in California. Um, and probably our last call today, we only have a few mi- minutes. Hello, Newell. How are you doing, Steve? I, I listen to you a lot. Thanks. It's always a great pleasure. Thank you. Uh, when you mentioned uh, the angel Moroni, Moroni, you know, that the uh-huh. Mormons believe delivered that message, yeah. Uh, one of the things I noted, and I've read through the Bible several times, cover to cover now, and as much as I can remember what I read, uh, there's no angel Moroni listed in the Holy Bible, Old or New Testament. True. Whereas, whereas for Muhammad, Gabriel, of course, was at least a real angel. And um, anyway, I think that's got to put him at least an inch ahead of the Mormons. Yeah, well... The thing is, uh, the Bible only gives names of two angels. Yeah, that sounds right. Gabriel and, and Michael are the only angels mentioned by name in the Bible. Mm. All, but there are millions of angels, the Bible says. So there could be angels with other names. I'm, I, I certainly don't believe there's an angel called Moroni. Yeah. But, uh, but I don't think, it would, you know, if there was an angel that appeared to me and gave me his name, I wouldn't require that he has to be either Gabriel or Michael to be a true angel. Uh, of course, I've never seen an angel and don't ever expect to. But the point is, uh, the, the fact that Moroni is not an angel mentioned by name in Scripture isn't, uh, it, it isn't the, the killer for, for Joseph Smith's uh, claims. No, you got uh, it there. Yeah, but, but uh, you know, for a man to say that Gabriel appeared to him, or Michael appeared to him, or Jesus appeared to him, you know, the, the fact that these names are found in the Bible doesn't in any way validate the claim that, that this person really saw it, the real Gabriel or the real Jesus or the real Michael or whatever. So, I'm, I'm, you know, I think they're pretty much on the same footing. But you're right. Gabriel is a, an angelic character in the Bible, and Moroni is not in the Bible. And thank you so much for your program. And if I might comment one more a moment. Quickly. Uh, I had a book yeah. of Mormon one time, and I was reading it in a motel. And uh, the first page kind of tells the lie. It calls itself a book of equal holiness to the Holy Bible, which we right. know is a lie, of course. Right, it is. You know, Noah, I'd like to talk to you more, but I'm out of time for the program. I appreciate your call. God bless you. God bless you, too. Bye-bye now. All right, you've been listening to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg. We're here Monday through Friday. At the same time, this is Friday, the last day of our broadcast week, but we'll be back Monday, Lord willing to continue to take your calls. Uh, We are a listener-supported broadcast. Uh, I don't take any uh, money for doing this, and there's no paid staff at all, but all of our overhead consists of paying the radio station and the phone company for the 800 number. The radio stations that carry this charge us money for that, of course, as that's how they make their living. And it costs us thousands of dollars a month, and we don't have any sponsors. We don't sell anything. Uh, We just uh, depend on people who listen uh, to carry, I guess, the load if they wish to, and if they don't, we go off the air. But if you'd like to help us out, the address to write to is the Narrow Path, P.O. Box 3633, Santa Cruz, California, 95063. You can find the address and many resources available to you for free at our website. Hundreds of MP3 files, lots of stuff there. The website is www.thenarrowpath.com. Dot com. That's The Narrow Path, just like the name of the show. So Monday, this is Steve Gregg saying thanks for joining us. Tune in Monday again, and we'll talk again.